Spill what's actually good afternoon now, um, and welcome to um, today's symposium. I'm as you've heard, my name is Joe Buffoni, and I'm a Deputy Chief Officer with the Country Fire Authority. Um, but I would like to begin by also paying my respects to the traditional custodians um, of this land that we are meeting on today. Also, I'd like to thank you for the invitation to speak today. Um, it's my pleasure um, to be here, and um, the actual three-day symposium looks um, very, very interesting, and I'm sure that some of the things that I'm just going to touch on very, very lightly are going to be explored in a lot more detail. But as an operational person, I want to acknowledge also the um, fantastic work that has been done by many of you in this room today, so both individually and collectively. Um, and what I'm going to talk about is how we actually bring that science and interface it with operational decision making in the control domain. So, in the words that I've just learned of MacArthur, but slightly modified, uh, I'm not a scientist rear end, but I do understand control. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about. Um, bringing fire science into the control room. I'm going to talk probably a little bit about the control domain, so rather specifically the control room, because in some ways the control room is just a facility that facilitates a whole range of clinical decision making, but, and then that then rolls all the way down to the fire line, to the person on the truck. So I don't just want to focus on solely just the, um, the control room, although the focus will be a little bit on that. Um, the other aspect is uh, a lot of my talk is a little bit Victorian centric and I think that there's an obligation on Victoria to actually stay focused on fire science, fire behaviour and a whole range of fire activities um, being that unfortunately we actually lead the states in fatalities and um, housing losses since 1901, um, second only to New South Wales and then Tasmania and South Australia that actually follows. So if you think about science, and as I said, I'm not a scientist, I'm an operational person, but for me, if you think about it, we're talking about facts, we're talking about systematic studies, we're talking about logarithms, we're talking about metrics, we're talking about all these things that come together, um, and quite often about uh, systematic studies to provide facts is very much about the science environment. And then we want to bring that into decision making or into the control environment, the control domain. And there are a lot of social scientists that have done, uh, who have uh, done significant work about decision making in the control environment, in a crisis, in an emergency, uh, call it whatever you wish. And many of them, in particular people like Gary Klein, Paul DeHart, uh, Flavel Cohen, Woods and many others, um, have done significant studies about how people make decisions in that crisis, in that control domain. And quite often you hear the word sense-making, meaning-making, metacognition, domain consensus and a whole range of other terms that sort of set the scene. But regardless of the authors and regardless of the studies, there's some aspects that are consistent in that domain. And the first thing is about what actually is control. And we talk about taking control, we talk about the control room, we talk about control and a whole range of things, but the reality is it's actually about making some critical decisions in a very, very complex environment. And in some ways it actually is about making sense or making meaning out of chaos. And that's the starting point, is very much about that chaos. It then flows on that quite often there are high state missions or objectives that are in that space, significant risks and consequences, and quite often there are conditions where few things can be immediately controlled or manipulated, and in particular in those early stages. And then of course they are characterised by information lag, data overload, then knowns versus unknowns, strengths versus weaknesses, danger versus opportunity, highly complex, time pressured, and then there's trade-offs, decision trade-offs between time and accuracy. And then the other core aspect of that, and many of you will have been, will have been faced by this, 
is that they are decisions that are made in minutes and they're often scrutinised for months and years by teams of lawyers or reviewers or I'll even say sideline experts that sit back in 20, with 2020 hindsight and not replicating the conditions of the time of those decisions. And so when you, when you match that and you think about the science component, which is very structured, very clear, based on facts, and then you drag that into an environment where it is complex, it is uncertain, there are a whole range of pressures, how do those two blend? Well, in actual fact, I would say that they are critical partners. And I would say that they are critical partners because, in fact, the science component, if it's done correctly, if it's applicable, will actually reduce some of the complexity and some of the decision-making and will free up the ability to analyse the unknown. So I think that, for me, that's one of the critical aspects. And the other key part is around defendable decision-making. Now, I don't want this to be um, that that's a critical component of it because we make the best decisions possible on the day to get the best outcome. Very much about protecting life, protecting property, protecting critical assets, etc. But the reality is, is that we have to be able to defend and be accountable for our decisions. And a solicitor called Mark Scoggin came to Australia and did the Australian tour and he's defended a lot of people in this area in particular, the police that um, shot uh, a suspected terrorist that turned out not to be a terrorist. And there's some key things that he was very, very adamant about in defendable decision making. And the first thing is what you decided or ordered, why you did it, when you did it, how you did it and in consultation and with expert advice. So I think that there's that link there into the science component, that expert advice. Unanimity and consensus or that collective defence. So did you engage with a number of people or did you go in a closet and make a decision and come out and then actually say, well, this is it? You know, the autocratic sort of decision style. Did you actually implement or achieve your decision? Did you review your decision? And was it logged or otherwise credibly provable? And can you actually locate it or recreate that to actually say, yes, I actually did that? So when you bring all that together, from my perspective, fire, science, and I call them basically technology ecosystems, because I see the end-to-end -end, um, component of it, now play an absolute critical role in supporting decision-making in the control domain. And the important thing is, is that they improve the confidence levels um, of your decision making, but they also improve the defendability of your decision making. And I think that that's an important factor. There's another aspect of it as well, is that by society itself expect us to actually use the best available science and technology. And the reality is that despite all the, all the valid reasons as to why we can't or can, they don't take that as an excuse. It's not excusable. They think that if it's available in open source, if they can access it, how come the authorities can't access it? And the other thing is too, I'm not precious about the decision making, but I want to share a bit of that so that when I'm standing up in the, in the Royal Commission, that I can actually draw on some of my science partners to actually say we use the best science, we use the best systems, we were connected and in fact here is the evidence as to why we went down that path. Now it might not have produced, you know, that might, have been, might not have been the, the ideal outcome for a whole host of reasons, for a whole host of reasons, but in actual fact at least we use the best available science and technology systems to actually assist us in making those decisions. And I will emphasise assist us in making those decisions because the systems and technology do not make the decisions for you. They are decision support and I think that that's an important factor. There are other components and along what I would describe as the, um, the prevention preparedness, readiness and response continuum, there's a whole host of factors that we take into account and, and in actual fact Phil's presentation sort of touched on some of those. But for, a, for an operational decision maker, the first, end, the first component is very much around dynamic situational awareness. 
And in some ways, the new technology, the science and the modelling actually helps us with that because it gives us a bit of a picture. It gives us some sort of visualisation about what might be happening out in the field. And the other thing is those that are on the right of the fire ground have a slightly different picture that the next level has and then obviously um, from the area that I generally operate in is at the state level. So the modelling now provides us and that, and that capability provides us with a whole different capability for that situational analysis. But that's only one component. And I would actually challenge us that collectively that's one of our biggest challenges is getting timely situational awareness to feed our decision making, warning systems, strategic um, operational um, strategies uh, and tactic tactics that we're actually employing. And within that, there's a whole range of other things, and that's prioritisation of activity. Obviously, with uh, the pr protection of life, um, has to be number one. Preparedness and readiness arrangements. The, 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 the actual declaration of total fire bans. The calling of code red slash catastrophic um, days with um, the changes to the fire danger rating system. Ignition probability. Agency readiness and capability requirements. Suppression strategies, timely and relevant public warnings, and design and establishment of strategic fire runs. And even within that, you know, we have guidelines that are actually being produced, but more importantly now, that's shifting into um, systems. So rather than actually having to, you know, do the maths and work through that on, on a desktop, you're actually using a desktop computer to actually do some of that, which I think is, is very much the next step. And then there's a whole range of fire uh, aspects that Phil touched on, um, which is rate of forward progression, perimeter and area spread, combustion rate, fire intensity, and I'll go on and on and on with all those that you are all very, very familiar with. But there's a couple of factors there. Is that if we get it wrong, or if we get it right, there are consequences to that. And it's actually a trade-off of the consequences that we're actually that we're actually doing when we're making some of those decisions. And ultimately, it is about minimising um, minimising the consequences, and it is about that trade-off. And it's interesting when you have a look in some of the decision-making, and in particular in, the, in this graph here, and what I spoke about earlier, that in the chaos component, there's no frame or hypothesis available. So you are, at, you are actually making some of those decisions in that chaos space. So what are the drivers? And we've sort of touched on some of the historical uh, information which I found was absolutely fascinating, I think a nice setting. But I wake up this morning, have a look at the Sydney Morning Herald, and it says, bushfire risk will get worse, research shows. So that's the start. And yesterday, in Saturday's age, there was a whole range of articles around um, the percentage of people that will stay. And I know Kevin uh, told us, I've already had a discussion with him, that uh, there's some commentary um, from Kevin, and I'll actually touch on that a little bit later. But really, the drivers are very much, um, you know, we started, uh, and I think Phil's given us a bit of history on where we actually started, you know, manual, uh, very, very sort of uh, localised testing, the fire danger metres, maps, hand-drawn maps, um, the compass, VHF radios, all that sort of stuff was the control domain that we operated in. What's changed now? So what's different? Well, we've shifted significantly. And then Phil touched on the demographics have changed. So we've actually got a different cohort of community that actually sit in some of our fire risk areas. The 24-hour news cycle, don't underestimate that, the sort of pressures and the accountability that that places on the decision makers now. The politics. Politics now play a considerable role in our operations, whether we like it or not. And it also plays a significant role in some of the decisions that we make, even in prevention, preparedness and readiness, there's a significant uh, role of politics in those decisions. The accountability has never been high. The community, in fact, holds us to account. Technology is a driver and an enabler and provides us with some great opportunities, and I'll touch on that very, very briefly, and I'm sure that many others will speak a lot more uh, in depth of that. The more frequent larger fires has given us an opportunity to actually study um, both human factors and fire behaviour. 
And obviously there's a whole range of other aspects. But I would say that one of the big drivers in particular uh, from a community side is that they are better connected. They have access to open source data. They, in fact, are making decisions about their own safety through a whole range of different mechanisms. So gone are the days when people like myself stand up there in uniform and are the holder of all the information and decide on when we're going to tell you about what the risks are, we're going to share the information at a time that we choose. Those days are gone and the reality is that as operational people we have to accept that and in some ways from my perspective that drives us more to connecting with the fire science to help us in our decision making in a more timely way. And if I can actually share a personal experience which is not bushfire related but is fire related and about community being connected and understanding. It was actually a chemical fire in the west of Melbourne. It was called West Point, it was the facility. Um, the fire itself was contained but there was a significant smoke plume. The community were told to shelter in place. They were told by the authorities that everything was okay, that they weren't at risk, that the uh, parts per million were not going to affect them. They woke up the next day with all the fruit on their trees were dried up and shriveled. Their lawns were yellow, it was a chlorine fire by the way. Their lawns were yellow. Now I was tasked with going and actually engaging with the community. Um, you know, I think for my sins I sort of felt like I was a bloke on the end of a stick being sort of wheeled out. But no an important part, engaging with the community. And it was interesting to engage with them and then to sort of try to sort of work through well the authorities have said this and the authorities have said that and here's my dry apricots from the tree and look at my yellow grass. But what, was, what resonated with me more importantly is that they, they actually drew the data themselves from the EPA air monitoring systems and said, have a look at this. It was off the scale on that day. Here's the data. Now, I think that that is a telling story about community and their access to open source information. So what that drives from an operational perspective is we better be on the game and we better understand the science and the systems and the data and everything else that's available and make sure that as we're communicating they'll be matching their information um, with what they're hearing from the authorities and what their own access to open source data will be because they will want to corroborate their information with what they're hearing. The single point of, of, of truth of a uniform standing up there, there is still a significant amount of authority there, but it's not, it's not the single source anymore. And apart from anything else, they're actually out there sharing photos, information, you know, where the fire is, what's happening through social mediums now. So quite often, we're actually playing a bit of catch up on what the fire is doing as opposed to what's happening with the community. And so that in fact itself is driving a lot of our own, is driving a lot of our own um, thinking and some of our priorities. Um, our systems that we used um, and still reasonably reliable. Uh, but for me, what the future is, is absolutely exciting and really encouraging. I think that where we're heading is going to take us into a new space of decision making, a new space of being able to actually provide not only but timely uh, and tailored information, but actually targeted to local requirements. And out of a lot of the research that's done, that is very much one of, the, one of the claims that community really want is they want that information about what's happening to them locally. And from an operational perspective, what I want to be able to do is actually then be able to muster my resources into the areas of highest risk to be able to protect the community in the best possible way. So the better understanding I have of some of the potential, the better chance I have of making some of those um, appropriate decisions and defendable decisions. And then we progress. So we've shifted from the, from the um, hand-drawn uh, map that's you know, quite often utilised, um, sometimes in the back room, and that's the other thing that I want to emphasise, is that it doesn't matter how good we get with our scientists connecting in, if it's not connected to the operational decision making, it's wasted. If it actually isn't brought out, it isn't part of the operational decision making system, it's actually wasted. 
And we've seen some examples of that, and I don't want to be standing somewhere with somebody telling me, I told you so. I don't want to be standing somewhere where somebody says, well, I had this information, but I couldn't get it to you, or I had this information. And that's one of the things that I'm encouraged about is where we're heading, is that the information is available to all. So you can actually access it on a whole range of different systems. You don't have to wait for somebody to knock on the door, you know, when you're in the chaos space and actually say, oh, by the way, here's a map that I've produced. You can actually access it make some decisions on it. And then, and I know that there's going to be some further, uh, some further uh, uh, discussion on this, we're moving into a new dimension now, which is, um, again, automated fire prediction, uh, which obviously has the critical components in the back end, the science in the back end, and not only is it showing us um, the fire spread uh, and potential, but it's also showing us um, in 3D, in graphical formation, the visuals. And as an operational person, and as I said, I'm not a scientist, that's fantastic. It gives me an indicator. But there's one point that I want to keep reinforcing. The models are not the sole solution. They are not the answer. They do not make the decisions. If I look at this, it gives me an indicator, but I want to test it. I want to ground truth it. I want to make sure that what I'm hearing from the ground is matching that or, or vice versa. And then that will guide me on actually making the decisions. And there are many, many, and I look at in the room, um, people that can give you a lot more detail on this, but I'm looking at it solely from a person that makes decisions in compressed time frames and quite often in that point of chaos. And then of course we've got all the fuel risks, the fuel loads, the dryness, etc all those aspects and that feed into um, our fuel data and again the main point that I want to make here and I know that there is uh, some of the team that actually do this in Victoria and they've been asked not to ask me any questions about this because <laughs> I'll just redirect it straight back to them um, but you know, again we're using satellite imagery and then we're using field data which is actually observations so it's that ground truthing as well as the, um, the satellite imagery bringing it in to a collated map that then field feeds the bureau, that then feeds the grass fire danger indice, and then the fire danger ratings. The end-to-end, -end, the systemic approach. And I'll push through this quickly, but um, our core partners, which very much being the bureau, who provide us with a whole range of services, but information, and how we actually connect into them. The grid weather that they provide now, um, the rainfall, uh, temperature, stream flows, um, and then this, which I understand is then there's probably going to be a little bit more about this, which is POAMA, Predictive Ocean Atmosphere Modelling for Australia, which is now about long range outlook, brings together all the modelling into one. And the key aspect, as I've told from this, is that we now have computing capability that allows us to do that. Previously, the numbers had to be crunched to actually, you know, and a whole range of judgments. So that takes us into a next, into a new dimension. And I've got this one up here, and again, this is for me the real important part. All the numbers, all the crunching, all the graphs and everything else at the back end are all really good, and I can delve into that if I want to. But this is the stuff that, for me, as an operational person, becomes really critical. It's actually done with the end user in mind. So, in fact, I can have a look at that and I don't have to do a whole host of analysis. The other critical factor that I keep um, reinforcing is the human intelligence component. And all those fancy systems and all that data and all the science that backs it up still needs to be ground truth. It still needs to be connected to what's actually happening on the ground make sure that the human ink component is connected as part of that end-to-end -end ecosystem that actually verifies what's actually occurring. Now I'm going to touch quickly on, um, on the future and this is very much where uh, there's some work done in Victoria that I know and the Fire Service Commissioner is driving this um, with vigour. It is very much about a common operating picture it's very much about a single ecosystem that feeds off a whole range of other systems and data sets. 
um, and uses cloud computing. Now I'm not going to go into the detail of this, but the main thing is that this takes us into a, an area, this takes us into an area that you can have a single platform, you can go into many, many other different systems. As an operational person, this is the next generation. This is the next leap forward of technology, connecting with science and supporting operational decision making for a whole host of different reasons and integrating a whole, rate, a whole load of different systems. Which takes me to the final, just about the final slide. And it's interesting that some of the questions were starting to lead here. And it is about the MacArthur system, it is about the fire danger rating system, and it is for me about the next generation fire danger rating system. And it's interesting that there is a whole range of research and science and a whole range of systems that are in place, but have they actually been brought together to refocus on the next generation fire danger system. And MacArthur has served as well, and we know um, the intricacies of it, we know its limitations. But there's a few questions that I probably would like to ask. And that is, have we now stretched the science, and have we now stretched the system way beyond its capability? If you have a look at this, this is very much about warning the public. So this is the output end. But we heard that MacArthur was very much about suppression difficulty. And yet we're using MacArthur for a whole host of other reasons. And we have. We've stretched the science. And we rely very, very heavily on this to advise the community. If we can get to the point where this can be more refined, more targeted, very, very specific to, to, to key communities, it changes the way that we operate at the moment. You think about the consequences of calling a, code, a, a catastrophic day for Victoria Code Red. There are huge consequences, and more importantly, are people actually going to listen to that when there is no fire in the landscape? Critical thing. The information that was, uh, that was uh, in the um, Saturday's Age, 29% of people will wait and see. And Kevin Tolhurst is in, I've had this discussion with him, He's challenging this at the moment, this thinking, saying it really doesn't provide people with, a, you know, with the information that they need to make the right decisions. And in fact, as we know, severe, extreme and code red all definitely warrant total fire ban uh, declaration, but people don't even focus on total fire ban declarations now. It's sort of like a thing that's sort of set um, a little bit lower. And if I could just draw on... Um, the, uh, the Royal Commission, because um, they actually did focus significantly on the fire danger rating system. And I, did, I have to say, and I shouldn't, but when you sometimes reflect on, on some of, the, some of the, um, the information that was produced, I did chuckle a little bit, and I'll speak to you about why. And I'll read out, this is not verbatim, but I'll read out the general theme of what the Royal Commission said. Um, a number, basically, more should have been done in relation to warning, supporting incident management teams and statewide planning. A number of relatively simple practices, I want you to, this is where I had a bit of a chuckle, simple practices would have greatly assisted in identifying shortcomings in warnings and in the composition and effectiveness of incident management teams. So in other words, that controlled the mind that I've been speaking about. First one was around IMTs to provide, as soon as practical, an incident summary action plan. And that should enable everybody to ascertain whether such urgent matters such as warnings, resources, firefighter safety have been factored into the fire strategy. OK, you can sort of go tick. Then the provision of predictive maps and list of warnings and make sure that they're updated. And on the basis of the predictive maps, maps and list of warnings, confirming that communities in the probable path of the fire have been warned. Ensure that warnings took place, uh, took adequate account of known weather information such as wind changes. Issue of additional warnings as required on the basis of the predictions for all the fires developing priorities for the fires according to the greatest threat to life and safety and allocating state resources with that in mind. Um, and I'll just reiterate some relatively simple practices. I'll leave you to think about that. So if we think about the MacArthur system, I ask again, have we, stretched the under, have we stretched what it was designed for? Can we be confirmed that the, that the underpinning science will stand up? And not if, 
but when it is scrutinised in how we have applied it and how we have used it in our decision making, will it stand up? I'm getting a bit of the wind up here. So in conclusion, I just want to make a couple of key points. Fire science and supporting ecosystems um, are critical and uh, to making good decisions uh, in the control domain. We must have confidence in the science and ecosystems. And I think that that's a critical part. If you want to engage the operational people, they have to have confidence that the systems are right and are robust. The dynamic ground truthing and including the human dimension for me is a, is a critical component. The products and services must be with the end user in mind. So it's great to have these fantastic sort of um, systems and that, but if you need to be so specialised that they're not applicable, well then I don't think that it's going to hit the mark. Again, reinforcing that science and research needs to be applicable and that the investment and design of the ecosystem is end-to-end -end and must be able to integrate. I spoke about the future with Vine in Victoria. That will be something that I think you know, we're aspiring to collectively, but not so much to Vine, but that sort of model. So you have to be able to integrate. And the other thing is, we are in tight fiscal times. And so the reality is that to complete to compete for investment dollars, we must be able to demonstrate the direct benefits. But in that, I want to encourage you to please take some of those things on because I see the science being a critical component to the future and I want it to be part of my decision making. Thank you.